Well, Happy New Year, and um, New Year. we're looking forward to a very prosperous uh, 2020. And uh, we hope to join all of you in, in that wish. Uh, our speaker this evening is uh, Jason Latier. Uh, Jason is a master's student in plant breeding in horticulture. Uh, he's a Tom Ranney student. Um, and he was a 2007 intern here at the Aubrey. Um, then he's second uh, intern class. So um, Jason's working on cytology, micropropagation, uh, breeding for a range of ornamental species. Uh, his previous work experience has been diverse. He's worked with micro, micro propagation of tropical plants at the uh, Nectandra Institute in Costa Rica, as well as the Sainsbury Orchid uh, Conservation Project at Kew Gardens. Uh, Jason's former experience in plant breeding includes research internships at uh, Pennsylvania at the Garden Genetics LLC and Longwood Gardens. Uh, he's a current recipient of the Spring Meadow uh, Scholarship as well as the Glenn Goldsmith Breeding Excellence uh, Scholarship from Syngenta. Um, I had an opportunity to hear Jason uh, present the seminar at, uh, in horticulture science. And uh, I suggested to him at the time his uh, lecture on uh, E.H. Wilson would be a great uh, event for us at the, uh, for, for friends of the Arbor Reading Lecture. So his uh, uh, lecture this evening is uh, uh, Plant Hunting Expedition to E.H. Wilson. Jason? Thank you, Ted. It's great to be here. I feel like I've come full circle after being an intern and now being able to give a talk here. Um, I graduated right over there on the other wall in <laughs> uh, 2007. So, um, and my trip, my, ro my route back here was pretty circuitous, as uh, I'm going to show you right now. But um, when I gave my departmental talk to a room full of horticulture professors and um, botany professors, the first question I asked them is, how many people actually know who this is? And I kind of want to ask that right now. So you guys are doing better already than they are, so good for you. Well, of course, this is E.H. Wilson. He was, he was a horticultural superhero, um, plant explorer extraordinaire, um, kind of late, late comer in the Victorian age of plant exploration. Um, some of the highlights of him, he, he introduced about 1,000 plants into cultivation, a uh, hundred of those being um, uh, first class, uh, first class awards of garden merit through the RHS and the highest award of plant can attain. Um, and during the course of his career, his, uh, his herbarium specimens numbered in the tens of thousands, many of them being new to science. So um, that's who he is. He's a legend. So who am I to be talking about him? Well, nobody really, but I will tell you about where I am. Um, I am back at NC State after doing an undergrad. Uh, two undergrad degrees, one in horticulture and one in botany. Um, did a little bit of traveling, we'll talk about in a second. Um, I am back working under Tom Randy doing a plant breeding master's project. Um, so this is kind of where I've traveled. This is the route I took after leaving J.C. Ross. And, uh, I don't know if Pam Beck is here tonight, but I kind of have her to, to blame for this. She told me about Longwood Gardens, and I went there with about a week's notice and started working for them, and then kind of just traveled on out there, I kind of caught the fever. So um, I went from J.C. Ralston up to Longwood. Then uh, I got a job working uh, at Garden Genetics, which is a contract breeding company in, uh, near Penn State. Um, from there, I went down to the Nectandra Institute as a visiting scientist working with uh, plants of the cloud forest, which was an amazing uh, project. And then I got the McLaren Scholarship to the Garden Club of America and the Royal Horticulture Society. And and that let me kind of gallivant all over the UK for, for a spring and a summer. So I worked in places like Tresco Abbey, kind of off the southwest coast here. Um, oh, <laughs> um, the Eden Project down in Cornwall, Winfield House, uh, this is Obama right here in the picture, but it's the US Ambassador's residence in London. I get to work in that garden. Um, at Kew, Whistley, Edinburgh, all the, all the big ones. So it was, it was a trip of a lifetime. And as I was traveling around, and getting tours from these eminent botanists, they kept pointing out, this is an original E.H. Wilson collection. E.H. Wilson, collected from E.H. Wilson series. Well, I had a lot of time to ride around on trains going from garden to garden, and I kept reading about E.H. Wilson, and it kind of fascinated me. So basically, I returned to NC State. I had a little more time on my hands starting out, and um, 
Um, and I came back and I found this website, which is the Hartford BIA, and then it's just loaded with pictures. I've read up pictures from the 1800s, 1900s of planet exploration, original glass plate photography of these uh, planet explorers. And I wanted to look at the original books that Wilson produced, some of his, um, his travel journals and such, and they were like upwards of $1,000 to buy. So I went to the DHO library. They didn't have them, so I went down to the third floor in the old Chinese section, just perusing around down there. And lo and behold, they had a whole section of his books, some of them signed. I don't know how much they're worth, but you know, I'm sitting here with my coffee cup balanced on top of all these priceless books, you know, walking back to my office. They let me check them out. I don't know why they did it. And they've stayed in my office ever since. And whenever I caught a free moment, I just read through them. And I was like, ah, oh, all these great photos, you got all these great quotes, and you put together a talk. And so that's what I did. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Not that that qualifies me to give a talk on, on Wilson, but I'm going to give it a try using mostly his quotes and uh, people who know him better than do. So I want to open up the talk with one of my favorite quotes from a book he produced called Plant on Dina. Just to give you an idea for his flair of speech and for his huge personality. Um, it says, Give heed then ye, uh, whose environments the goddess flora enriches so lavishly the tale told here of distant lands, of their flowers, and of the few hunters who capture the truth, the trophies ye so love. <coughs> and thinking about what type of plant exploration uh, Wilson was doing, he was going after live material. So if he saw a plant he liked, he had to wait around for the flower and then wait for it to collect seed. He had to bring it back, try to introduce it, have all the RHS people kind of poo poo his introductions until finally they're like, no, it is an awesome plan. So it's a whole multi, you know, sometimes 10, 15 year process, um, as opposed to some explorers who would go in, take a botanic press, send it to a dusty herbarium, and they would write it up as a new species. So I, I think a little, little bit of what he was doing was a, a little more difficult. So um, the first chapter I'm going to talk about I titled uh, Doves, Pandas, and Mustachio Scots. Um, but this is basically talking about the role that fate had in plucking him from relative obscurity and, and making, putting him on this path to becoming one of the greatest plants in, in history. So early years, uh, Wilson was born in Chipping Canada, a quite little town uh, in Gloucestershire. Uh, as a teenager, he worked for uh, the nurseries of the Messrs. Hewitt at Solihull. Uh, Warwickshire, and uh, about this time his father died, and he was the oldest of seven children, so he had always dreamed of being a botany teacher. He had this amazing ability for recall, and he had great memory, but he had to start working. So he began working at Birmingham Botanic Gardens. He didn't, didn't make it into Queen's College because he had to work, but he also got to do some work at the technical school there where he won the Queen's Prize for Botany, <coughs> which got him into Kew Gardens. So then in 1897, at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, he uh, kind of distinguished himself, won the Hooker Prize, uh, named after J.D. Hooker, one of the directors there, and a plantsman in his own right. Um, he aspired still to become a botany teacher. And so in 1898, he entered the Royal College of Science in South Kensington, Kensington had a long career behind the lectern and enclosed in four walls, or so the story should have gone. But meanwhile, back up a bit. Um, this crazy looking man up here is probably one of the more interesting characters in uh, planet exploration that I've read about. Um, this is uh, Father Armand de Vive, and in 1869 he was on the other side of the planet in a, in a mission in the hills of China, where he came across Davidia and Glucrata, the dove tree. Um, it was described, he sent the material back in, it was described by uh, Bayon in 1871. Um, Father De Vita was an interesting character. He taught in Italy, uh, at the Savona College in Italy, where his, his reputation for really imbuing his students with a love of natural history and a love of plants, and he would actually get them involved and go outside and show them things. And he basically became really famous in the area, and his talents got back to his, uh, mission, his mission coordinators back in um, France, and he, went, he was sent to China, and then the, the, the the directors of the Natural History Museum kind of pilfered him from the, his missionary work to send him out and do some of these uh, collections. And his uh, comprehensive collections on zoological and botanical <laughs> species are some of the best ever collected. And he's most famous for introducing science to the great Canada. You can imagine being the first guy to come around the corner in a bamboo field and see him. <laughs> that must have been a great moment when this guy met this guy. <laughs> So, and, you know, just reading, I wish I had have time to do a whole talk on him, but, you know, his kind of split, split personalities as this amazing naturalist and fervent, you know, even evangelist. Um, 
it, it literally he had two phases when he was in France and Italy, and then when he traveled to China, he took on the role of a Chinese person. And just an amazing character, so do some reading about him. And anything that's named Armandii or Davidii, usually it's an honor. So here's the tree that he saw um, in the western high elevations uh, in uh, Sichuan, I believe it was. Um, this is the video of Blue Crowd. It does a little bit better in the north, um, but we do have them around here. Beautiful, beautiful pendulous white bracts. It looks like a dove. Some people call it a handkerchief tree. Um, this was the plant he described that he kind of fell in love with. Um, the other person operating in the area, so the area was Augustine Henry, which is a huge, another huge figure. Um, at end of time. Um, he was an Irish plant, so he was the son of a uh, 49er. He had this adventurous spirit and he graduated. He was raised in the Irish, he was born a Scotsman, but his father's spirit, he had it, and when he graduated, he knew a smattering of Chinese and a little bit of, he had a little bit of medical training, which was enough for him to be able to sell off and become a customs agent and assistant medical officer in China. Turns out the job was utterly boring. He had ten, his hours were 10 to 4 with an hour break, and just to deal with the sheer boredom, he went out and like looked at um, medicinal plants in China. Sent him back to Q. Q supported him, helped him with his ID, and the samples he was sending were some of the best they've ever received. So essentially, they commissioned or they petitioned um, the, the commit petition the commission petitioned the, the customs service to let him go out and do collections for them. And his first thousand specimens he sent back, a huge percent of those were new, and they'd never seen them before. And the Davidia, they had wrote up a special paper on the Davidia saying it was deserving of its own trip, um, its own collecting trip to collect live material and introduce it as a, as a beautiful tree. So that's kind of where we were starting. So he said, over the course of his career, he uh, sent uh, 15,000 dried specimens and seeds to Q. I think he, discovered something like 500 new species, 25 new genera, and an entire new family, the Trapelace, Trapelace uh, aquatic. Um, and he authored, uh, along with, um, along with the risk for saying, but it was a, it was a tome. Uh, this tree's a great bit in Ireland, akin to the Silva, written by, um, um, written at Harvard University, I don't know about her, So, uh, and E.H. Wilson had a huge respect for him. He said it's permissible to say that no one in any age has contributed more to the knowledge of Chinese plants than the scholarly Irishman. So he had the highest esteem for him. And just as an aside, I'm sure you have the J.C. Ross remember this story, but in and out, there's Henry I that blooms, really rare Chinese plants, supposed to bloom every 30 years. Bloomed after nine years here uh, in uh, a Raleigh yard, and it was released through J.C. Ross. And so that was named in honor. The other plants named in his honor. Uh, Lily and Henry I, Tiger's Lily, uh, Acer Henry I, and this beautiful little orchid, the Silver Pea So, in 1889, while he was st stationed at the port of Ichang, which is right here in Yubei province, and this star over here was where Armand de discovered his way high from the mountains where nobody could get to it other than a missionary. Um, he basically discovered one single tree on the right bank of the Han River, um, and this area became well known for plant collecting. So uh, here's the Han River, so it'll be on this right bank that he discovered. It. And here's the port of Yichang, where E.H. Wilson spent much of his, what the port I say, the uh, custom station in Yichang. Uh, this is where E.H. Wilson would spend much of his time. So in an encomium, which is kind of like a formal praise written by, uh, 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 by Augustine Henry, he said the video is worth any amount of money. It's only one tree of it, but doubtless there are others in the district. The video is wonderful. He, and he was getting old. He, did it, he was getting tied up more with his customs work. He said, you guys should just send a special collector to come and get this one. And so, the firm of Beach and Sons heard about this, and they were the major funders of the kind of the great age of plant uh, exploration, the Victorian age of plant exploration. Um, this, but the nursery was kind of undergoing a, a, a strange transition at the time. <coughs> Herbert Beach was was in charge of the nurseries, and um, he kind of had a nervous breakdown, as you can kind of tell here. <laughs> <laughs> so he was being really short with customers, kind of had trouble focusing. He was a great collector and explorer in his own right. He had met uh, he, had, he had met with Charles Frank Sargent talking about the Davidia. He wanted to go on a collecting trip. He was telling his brother he wanted to go. But he was just losing it, and he ended up dying at like, four, like 39 years old, you know, another nervous breakdown or something. Like that. Um, but Harry Beach took the business back there. He's a very gruff businessman, and he told his brother, "If you want to be part of the business, you have to put gallivanting in the 
about and come home and be part of the business. So um, basically, he uh, before I get to that, this this is the great Mackenzie's house at uh, at the Beach Nurseries, and this was think of the Victorian times. This was the great the great exhibition, the big glass exhibition house that uh, Queen Victoria had set up. The novelty, the new, the adventurous. It was a relative time of peace and prosperity. Everybody wanted something new. House plants and all these little yapping dog breeds were all coming about. You know, people didn't care about things that were utilitarian, like a work dog or a functional plant that you get food off of. People started wanting the novel and the new. Well, this is kind of coming to the end of that age, so they started seeing value in bringing more trees and, and you know, yard-type plants back into uh, their business. But they were famous mostly for orchids and Mackenzie's and some of these other novels. So, Harry Beach told his brother, you're not going to collect the video. Um, James wrote Charles Sprague Sargent at Harvard University. He still wanted to go collecting it, and uh, you can kind of see their relationship in some of their correspondence, and I thought it was an interesting quote from Harry Beach writing to Charles Sprague Sargent. Um, I regret that he has again bothered you on this matter. It's a great pity he's so impetuous. He seems to quite forget there's another side, there's another side to the quest question besides his traveling about. <laughs> Essentially, he didn't want him to get But Harry Beach did ask the Kew director at the time, W.T. Pisson and Dyer, to recommend a plant hunter to go collect this one single tree. And so, anybody guess who he selected? That's right. A young 22-year-old E.H. Wilson. It's a picture of him at 23. Um, they sent him to Coombwood Nursery for about six months just learning how to do her very impressives and how to store bulbs and store seeds and take scion and really collect young plants. And uh, this is kind of, a, kind of a hilarious quote in retrospect. He told him, uh, my boy, stick to the one thing you're after. Don't spend time wandering about. Probably almost every worthwhile thing in China has now been introduced. <laughs> uh, 1899. So, here's Coombe Wood Nursery where he learned uh, all of his um, collecting techniques. And just, again, on that quote that all worthwhile plants have been introduced, uh, Robert Fortune and some of the other collectors that were there, they mostly took from gardens in the settled portions, settled regions. Uh, Charles Marys, a big red-bearded collector of fame that kind of preceded Wilson, you know, he, he did go up into the mountains, but with red beard, you know, they would hear these tales of this red devil that wandered around and <laughs> run and scared away from him. They never seen such a thing before. So. Uh, Wilson had his work cut out for him if he was really going to get up into the mountains and develop a kind of political decor and learning how to deal with the, cust the customs of the people and the natives. So um, he had a lot to learn. But the mountain country was essentially overlooked by plant collectors. Um, Augustine Henry was really the first person to hear in these regions. Um, he was to meet up with uh, the young Wilson to kind of teach him and tell him where the tree was and how to collect some more. Um, so essentially it was Henry who gave Wilson the key to the western part of China. But uh, Wilson, he was going to have to open the door and make it successful. So chapter two, um, burgeoning hunter, Harvard, Jesse Jane, and search for the tragic stone. So in this one I'm going to talk about the trials and tribulations of which there were a lot that faced him on his first trip. Um, but I, I love this quote out of this book, China Mother of Gardens. It says, the China I traveled over and the China I tell of is not that to which the visitor or the resident is familiar. It is not a China of cities teeming with people or of ubiquitous rice fields, but one of forest and woodland, wild ravines and mountains, the higher peaks clad with eternal scenery. So you can understand why I enjoyed sitting late in my office up in the Florida River Park and reading his books. He has a great, great time. Anyway. So here's the port of Yichang where he would spend most of his time. Obviously, Henry is down here in Samal, so you can see he has to go a long way, all the way down here in Yunnan province. So I'm going to tell you his little story, or his little trek down there, which proved to be quite difficult. But just a little bit of the history of China, the China he was walking into, when he left the port um, at Liverpool, they basically told him, uh, or at least the story is that uh, Beach told him, um, the likelihood is that you're going to get killed and your body's never going to be found. <laughs> <laughs> kind, of like, kind of what they were sending him out to. Um, at, in you know, 1889, or 1899, right at the turn of the century, he's going. So, um, China is a nation in decline. 1839 to 1860, the Opium Wars were ripping it apart. Um, Britain and France captured most of the port of towns, which was 
good for plant exploration. Don't get me wrong, but um, the city or the the country pretty much hated their the, the foreigners running their ports. Uh, also, the Taiping Rebellion uh, occurred right in the middle of the 1800s with the Manchu Dynasty. 600 cities destroyed, 20 million people killed. Um, also, right before, like the years right before Wilson came, China was defeated again by Japan, who took Korea and Formosa and Taiwan. Um, took, the, took those uh, those places from them. So they were not doing too well, unfortunately. Um, in 1898, the 100, year, the 100 Days of Reform, uh, there was a reform-minded um, emperor of uh, the Guangzhou who took over, but. Uh, there were factions, the conservative factions hated this guy. They thought he was just a pawn of the foreign imperialist power. So um, the Yiho Tuan, which is, uh, I love the name, the Righteous Army, this is, this is um, was short to the Boxers. So essentially the Boxer Rebellion was taking off right as each Wilson was about to step foot in his three piece suit onto the, onto the rough shores of uh, China. So that's what he was walking into. But first, April 1899, Wilson was going to set out from Liverpool to Boston with the Balmy and meet up at Arnold Arboretum with Charles Craig Sargent. <clears throat> he had just turned 23, had never been more than a few miles from his, from his native soil, didn't speak Chinese, didn't speak French, which is a major uh, language of port towns. Um, in later writings, he said he mostly traveled as a parcel on his first mission, <laughs> uh, traveling around uh, in China. Um, but uh, anyway, he was decided to travel by way of the United States, stopping at Harvard first. So he was going to spend five days with Charles Sprague Sargent, this epic figure at Arnold Arboretum, um, who was a friend of Augustine Henry, and he also uh, supported Augustine Henry's efforts to uh, collect herbarium specimens and send back as much of them sent back to the herbarium. Um, very knowledgeable in the floor of southern Yunnan, which is where he was supposed to meet up with Augustine Henry, so it was a great time to meet him. Uh, he consulted Sargent on uh, trees and shrubs likely to be found there, obtained reading materials for his long journey across America, and learned the newest techniques for shipping seeds and uh, plants on long distances. So he got six months of training in Kroom Woods, five intensive days with Sargent. He was ready to go collect some plants. Uh, upon meeting uh, Dr. Sargent, he said after a formal greeting, he pulled out his watch and said, I'm busy now, but at 10 a.m. next Thursday, I'll be glad to see you. I voted an autocrat of autocrats, but when our next interview took place, I find them, found him the kindness of autocrats. So, um, he eventually developed almost a hero worship type of relationship with uh, Sargent. But at this time, he was still a young man in his 20s, and uh, he did study about the Chinese people, the culture, the heritage on his long train ride across the continent, arriving eventually in San Francisco, but uh, he did say he enjoyed occasionally partaking in the tales of Jesse James and all the outlaws and cowboy tales uh, as he was riding across the country, so it um, was kind of, kind of interesting uh, thought. Uh, but eventually he sailed, sailed from the port in San Francisco and made it to Hong Kong in 1899. Here's his portrait when he goes, a little bit rougher than when he left, but his mustache is still well intact. One of the best mustaches in Portugal. <laughs> Maintained it all throughout his <laughs> So we, Wilson reached Hong Kong June 3rd, 1989. He sailed south to Haiphong in Indochina and ended up and uh, up on the river Leo Pei in Vietnam on the southern Chinese border. Mm -hmm. Say again? Yes, yeah, I'm in it. Thank you. You find any more of those? Give it a talk twice every time. <laughs> so he traveled along the southern border of Vietnam and uh, Laos, what is today Vietnam and Laos, and uh, he had a mission to meet up with Henry and his map. So here's Hong Kong up here. Here is Haiphong, and here up here is where uh, Henry is. So. Um, and talking about his his uh, journey to meet up with Henry, he said, I crossed no less than 11 district ranges, highest being 8,200 feet, many exceeding 7,200 feet, more fearfully steep. In one place we exceeded 1,000 feet in three quarters of an hour. The easiest way to climb such a mountain is to hang on to a mule's tail and let it drag you up. <laughs> so this is the kind of terrain he was facing. So again, here's Wing Z where he started his journey and he was making his way overland. Uh, to Samal for all these mountain ranges. Um, the overland part of the journey again began in Mingzi. Surveys were being conducted for the railway uh, from Hanoi to, to uh, Hunan, or to Yunnan. 
And uh, the anti-foreign anti sentiments were really high, right before it came. A lot of towns had been burned, a lot of foreigners had been killed, so this was walking into, and did get delayed a bit. Um, there were riots in Lindsay, houses burned, people killed. Um, he pretty much said in one of his writings that if he had ended up there a week sooner, he probably wouldn't have made it out alive. Um, so he had to delay his journey, say, in the French frontier town of Leo K. Unfortunately, the French were putting in the railroad, so they kept him there as their guest, but they kind of thought he was a British spy, so, you know, he's not having a great trip at this point. And he pretty much didn't speak too harshly of all the difficulties he faced as a plant explorer, except for these ends he had to say. He said they were full of animals and people, and the leaves, the roof leaked, and there would be this quagmire of just nastiness on the floor all the time, and he hated it. It was the worst thing he'd ever seen, but he wasn't the type of person complaining too much. But these ends really kind of set him off. It's kind of fun reading about him. So here's, uh, here's Wilson over here. <laughs> so in one of these towns, he received an encouraging letter from his employer, Harry. He said, keep up your courage and never lose heart. Failure and disappointments in the very nature of things you must have. But always come up smiling and never allow yourself to believe things are bad. Rely on it. They could always be worse. <laughs> so again, thanks, boss. Uh, and I'm going to continue on from the hotel um, to try to meet up with Henry. So he traveled for about 17 days, and pretty much the only thing he had to say about Samal when he got there in his journals was that it was the most godforsaken place imaginable. Um, upon his arrival, he met Henry even for his men. He's just been transferred back to Ming Z, so he has to go back the same way he came. But luckily, they did get to travel together, and they talked tales of the dove tree and other plants he had seen. Um, up the, at the Han River, and uh, they found a little botanical jewel along the way. Jasminum primulinum, or now Jasminum uh, mesinii, um, became very popular in Europe and England, received first class certificate from the RHS in 1903. Um, they believed it escaped, escaped cultivation from one of the towns um, in that region. So, Wilson, re Wilson returned uh, to Hong Kong for Christmas, made provisions to travel up to Shanghai to Yanta to up to Shanghai, or from Shanghai, up the Yangtze. Okay, so uh, he, his port town, was, or his base station was in Yunnan. Where I arrived in February 24th, 1900, was his headquarters for two years. He made plans uh, accordingly. He purchased a native boat, engaged some countrymen to assist him in his collecting. Did a short series of prospecting, prospecting trips of country uh, were undertaken for the purpose of getting some acquaintance with the flora and for testing and training his men. So this was the time he was really developing as a plant hunter, developing a rapport with the men who he would use in multiple trips when he returned in the future, you know, doing about four trips to uh, China. And he used the same men. He had a very good rapport. And uh, his, his, his ability to, to um, work with the natives is kind of what made him a success. So, uh, um, up the Yangtze. After learning uh, where to find the dove tree, Wilson ventured on to Shanghai, traveled up the Yangtze. Uh, he traveled lightly compared to a lot of botanists at this time. Uh, the cargo boats he used were about 60 tons, and they uh, were built from cypress wood. Uh, cypress wood. Uh, this is a colorized photograph that he took when he was there. Um, he called them houseboats. They reminded him of the houseboats he saw when he was in England. You can see the little compartment back here with the little glass windows that you could ride along in. Uh, here's a picture he took going up the Yangtze out of the window of the rapids. Um, so before, he had gotten a hand-drawn map from Augustine Henry. And I don't I didn't put the map up. Um, but it was a little map, not very big, and it was very rough, very hand-drawn. It covered about the same same amount of territory as upstate New York. So it was nice that he even found where he was going to begin with. But a very generalized map. Uh, almost exactly a year from leaving Liverpool, he arrived in the village where Henry said, the single specimen of the video was. Um, some of the natives, at, uh, he asked some of the natives about the tree, he asked if he could show it to them, the villagers pointed it out, but he saw a freshly made little little hut there, a little building, so it kind of worried him, and this is essentially what he saw of the one tree. After a year's worth of traveling, they had cut the tree on another little hut. He, uh, he said on August 25th, 1900, this solitary tree was my sole objective, I asked the natives to show it to me. Imagine my consternation when they pointed to a stump and a, a newly built cabin. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well that night. <laughs> so, but the good news is that uh, he went back to Yichang, and uh, late in May 1900, he found some of his first 
in Tacovidia in the mountains of south, south of Ichan. Um, the trees were in flower, and by the summer, 11 total were located and all through the, the collection number was 980, so that tells you how many plants he had collected during his time up to getting to the video. So it was pretty prolific. Collected about 15,000 seeds, 13,000 plants were raised at Kuhnwood Nursery, and they found this strange germination pattern that uh, W.B. Hemsley, a Q, uh, ended up writing up and uh, giving the name double dormancy, so the radical uh, would break dormancy the first year, and then the shoot would break dormancy the second year. So that um, yeah, was a pretty big publication. So after, um, oh, one, one note of this. So when he, when he eventually got back to England, um, he realized that the French had actually collected a specimen of the video and raised it in a nursery. So technically, he wasn't the first to collect it. When asked about it, he addressed it in this way, that after 16 years, I had thought of interest for history's sake desirable to place on record the facts concerning the vicissitudes and difficulties that have set my path in the uh, introduction of every seedling plant but one of this remarkable tree. So he kind of gave a nod to the French that they got it first, but the majority of them were his collections. Um, so then he spent a couple of years in each on collecting. Uh, he spent over the next two years collecting each on Wilson began to blossom as a plant hunter and diplomat that he was and as an author as well. Occasionally to the frustration of his employer who didn't like him writing all these things for the, the horticulture magazine and gardening magazine. Uh, he addressed it. He, he wrote him a letter on February 26, 1901, saying, um, Now there's another little point. I think it may also be taken for granted. Any spasmodic articles may lessen the value of possible publications undertaken in the future and more complete So that's, that's the Scots kind of um, what to do again. Um, finally, Beach gave him an ultimatum telling him he had to come home. So he said, When you receive these funds, the trip will cost over 2,000 pounds. I don't want to spend any more money. If you fill this amount and will not able to stay to the middle of January 1903, you must do your best and come away earlier. So Wilson left China in, 19, in the winter of 1902. Beach arranged a time for Will, uh, Wilson to spend at the Natural History Museum in Paris, which is like the best, uh, the best herbarium in the world, but he only gave him a day. <laughs> it was kind of tough on him again. And then finally Wilson returned home to England and received a gold watch. The inscription was, good job, Beach Wilson from James Beach. And there's the watch. The age was in the Well done. So, very nice. So, some of the plant introductions from uh, China. This is where I'm going to show you some of the original photographs. And use a lot of these old Sanderson glass plate cameras. Uh, so the photos are a little bit rough, but I think they're quite good for themselves. So, this is the first picture of the video here uh, that he took up in the mountains south of Bhutan. If you zoom in, you can see the little dub, little dub uh, bracts hanging. Um, also on this trip, he collected Acer Grissium, the paper bark maple. And that wasn't his day, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I had to throw a few modern photos. I can't do all black and white. It is the winter time. I'm throwing it in some color. So, uh, so here's Acer Grissium. This is this photo of Acer Grissium up in the mountains. This is the brand new that he's collecting. Um, Acer Davidii, the snake bark maple. Uh, here it is grow growing inside this um, rapid river here. Uh, another picture of the field. Uh, Actinidia chinensis, the kiwi fruit, is actually quite slow. We can use it actually in China. Barberis juliani, the very popular wintergreen barberry in this trip. Magnolia de la Bay, de la Bay. Uh, kind of their version of our silver magnolia. Uh, Budlia davidii, a variety magnifica, a beautiful Budlia. The drastic segments, with this nice little pink flowers and a nice little fall color here. The Drastis Sciences, the Chinese yellowwood came from the first trip. Uh, one of his best climbing vines that he, he felt he introduced was the uh, Clematis armandii. Again, made that name in honor of Armand de Vide, um, the evergreen Clematis. Another nice Clematis, uh, Montana dragon rubens. Schizophragmentary folia with this nice sterile and fertile flowers. Lenisera tragophila, the Chinese honeysuckle. Tony Aster Damari, Elias Sinensis related to our Physocarpus nine bark. Beautiful plant. Viburnum retinophyllum, which is one of his favorite foliage plants, he said, even without the, the flowers and uh, the fruit. He loved it for its rough, kind of wrinkly water foliage. Gorgeous plant. 
Thyrea Michii, here's the original photo of that, here's the modern garden. Uh, the Talpa Bardesii, beautiful Talpa. Uh, and here's the Talpa growing next to it, which I'm impressed. Prolopsis Michiana, winter hazel. Veridendron tulipro tinens. There's a modern day picture over here, it's growing in the mountains of China. Dipelta floribunda, part of Parva flora, here is growing in Central Park, <coughs> Central Vine, and one of Wilson's favorite plants. He didn't even see it in flower when he collected it, it just had a nice form and it had tons of seed, and then he grew it out, and he was so impressed with it, he gave it a name Beauty Bush, and that's the most beautiful thing ever. <coughs> so on his return home, uh, two months after his return, uh, Wilson married, marries Helen Gamberton. She eventually accompanies Wilson on some of his later trips. <laughs> And in January 1903, after a very short time with his new wife, it's off to China again in search of the yellow popcorn. Sorry, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be Wilson's second trip to China. Uh, Wilson arrived in Shanghai March 22nd, 1903. This would be a more extensive trip, better, well, better funded. Um, this is again through the firm of Beach Nurseries that he's going on. Uh, and he covers about two and a half years, takes him over 2,000 miles inland. Um, he becomes even more diplomatic in his dealing with the consulate people and natives. He, he, at this point, he feels comfortable dealing with all factions of people that he runs into. So it really helps him out. Um, this, this trip yielded vast amounts of information and photographs on the native peoples in the western part of the country. And uh, the Yellow Walk Poppy Ward um, took him to the Ming River to the highest elevations in the borderlands of Tibet. So here's the area, here's the Ming River. It's Chengdu, or the, the, the capital of Sichuan, which is where he would start <coughs> his longest trip through Tibet. So here's Mykonopsis integrifolia, a beautiful, beautiful plant. Uh, grows at elevations above 11,000 feet. This is the plant he was after. Um, so he found some of his former staff available still, quickly organized his expedition. Rented a boat on the Yangtze, names it after his new wife, Helena, and I uh, said of it, I may bring me luck and proportion as my dear one has. Very sweet. Um, published accounts of his travels and leaves from my Chinese notebook in the, in the Gardner's Chronicle um, throughout his entire travels around the world. So, summing up, I'm not going to spend too much time with this one, I'm going to get on to further, uh, further trips, but he said he had traveled some 13,000 miles in five and a half months. Um, at 11,000 feet, he came across his first plant of Mykonopsis and Tigerfolia. I'm not going to attempt to, uh, to record the feelings which possessed me on first beholding the object of my quest to these wild regions. Messrs. Beach dispatched me on the second, a very costly journey to the Tibetan border for the sole purpose of discovering this, the most gorgeous alpine plant extant. So that's how he felt about it when he finally came across. And then he got a, uh, another letter from his employer. You have a, you've had a great chance and have done well. Keep up your spirits and do equally well at this time. And you will all your life be glad of what you did in your youth. And I doubt you will ever have another such chance. <laughs> work, always work, it's the only thing. <laughs> Tough boss. So he found his yellow poppy wart and he came back home. In March of 1905, he returns home successful. He had, uh, through his second trip, he ships 2,000 seeds and plants, 5,000 herbarium specimens, many more new species again. Wilson accepts an appointment in 1906 as the botanical assistant at the Imperial Institute of London, a very nice job. He also wins the Beach Medal in 1906. So now he's set up for life. He can go on, put the traveling behind him, and settle into his new, new career here. And also, as another little gift from his employer, he said, I bought, you, I bought for you a pen, a flower of Mykonopsis and Tigerfolia, the five gray petals of gold, the numerous stamens, 41 diamonds, and I think it really looks like a Mykonopsis and not a single rose, which in jewelry it might have easily been done. I hope you like it. <laughs> and here's the little pen, and all of the diamonds. I would wear that. <laughs> Also, this time, Mur Primro Muriel Primrose Wilson is born, his daughter, which also would travel with him on future trips. Um, funny note, the very first primrose he ever brought back from his first biking trip just happened to flop, like they sowed the seeds and the flower, just happened to finally flower the day that his daughter was born. So that's why he called him Muriel Primrose Wilson. I tried everything to find out what happened to her. Anybody knows what happened to Muriel Primrose Wilson after her parents died? 
So plan introductions from his second trip to China. We get, of course, the Mykonopsis and Tegricolia, and here's a whole field of them growing up in the, the high country in Tibet. Mykonopsis pinacea, the red poppyborn, gorgeous naughty flowers. Uh, the Alexander rhubarb, really cool plant, here growing up in the high elevations. Uh, Ligularia etiana, a very large Ligularia, gorgeous. Got a hurry, apologize. Barbaris very looks at another popular barberry. Barbaris Wilsonii, Henry's barberry, and here's a cool case. Rose of Moyesii, the geranium rose, Rose of Wilmotii, Wilmot's rose. Um, Wilmot was a was a, a patron of all of these plant explorers and plant expeditions, and she was high up in the Royal Horticultural Society at the time, and uh, basically about 60 plants, I think, have her name on them. So if you ever see Wilmotii, I would name it. For syringa reflexa, the nodding lilac, beautiful nodding flowers in the small lilac. Uh, anyway, that's just a handful of plants from that trip. So, chapter four, the Himalayan adventure. So, at this point, his correspondence with Charles Frank Sargent, as I said, he looked up to him almost as a father figure, um, especially after his father died. And I think he probably filled that role a little bit. But uh, basically, Charles Frank Sargent wanted him to come work for him now that he was done with the beaches. But he had a pretty nice job and a wife and a daughter, so it was going to be hard to steal it away. Um, and a letter uh, responding to uh, Charles Briggs Sargent's desire to get him to work for Arnold Arboretum, he said, putting cinnamon aside, I have to throw up a government appointment, which at present is modest, has possibilities. Second, I have to leave behind a wife and child. These have to be provided for. Thirdly, there's a possibility of the pitcher going too often to the well. Also, the possibility of obtaining employment on my return did not appear may be brighter in the future as in the past. So he did not want to go. Just, but Sergeant, good as he is, uh, had to get what he wanted. He sent him his letter back. He said the trips were making a loan for the seeds of the fine conifers you discovered, and you're likely to remain practically unknown unless you revisit China. <laughs> if you have been in China for two years more, your service would have been very valuable to the Arboretum, either from a cultural point of view or from working up in Chinese material. So essentially, he is at kind of offering my job and some more glory and that kind of thing. And so December 27, 1906, he goes to work for Charles Frick Surgeon and leaves his family. <laughs> so this trip would focus on collecting seeds for David Fairchild of USDA, uh, Frank Meyer, who was also a huge figure in uh, horticulture and agriculture. Uh, he was to collect uh, various specimens of uh, conifers and conifer cones and for seed, which he did not want to do on my letter a little bit. And Walter Zappi of the Harper Museum was going to go collect pelts and animal skins. <coughs> they were to collect ferns for Herman Chris of Switzerland, orchids for oaks, and the lily bulbs for the Boston nursery, park park nurseries, and for Ellen Beaumont. Again. And uh, if anybody is a orchid expert it's in here, uh, we know the name Oak Ames. I was reading in his political season in Massachusetts. I was reading uh, Oak Ames' father and grandfather were involved in one of the biggest political scandals of all time. And with the Union Pacific Railroad, they basically bought hundreds of politicians dating all the way back to Lincoln and basically bribed them. Really interesting reading. And they spent most of their fortune paying off these things. They also created the uh, Republican Party up in Massachusetts. So really interesting history from Lincoln all the way up to the Ameses. So in these political times right now, it might, might be uh, well to read a little bit on the Ameses. They're really interesting. Anywho, this is Frank Meyer. Frank Meyer was almost the perfect opposite of H. Wilson. He was a very outdoorsy woodsman, didn't really like being around people, didn't really have the charm necessarily that H. Wilson had. Um, here he is beside a Gustav Lucido, a huge one, and he liked to do these photographs where he kind of made himself look like a ghost. <laughs> very strange guy. Um, and, and he was quoted by, uh, he sent a letter to a friend saying, I'm pessimistic by nature, I've not found the road which leads to relaxation withdraw from humanity and find and find let only find relaxation with plants. I live now in expectation of what will come. So he was kind of a strange, strange guy, but very important to agriculture and collected with some very valuable plants from the USDA. Um, he loved being outdoors. He said there's there there goes nothing above fresh air, a blue sky and one over one's head, and if some mountains or lakes can be added then life is worth living. I love to explore better than anything else. But he did not like Wilson. 
<laughs> His opinion of Wilson was so low, like, I just got a book for Christmas on Frank Meyer, I've been reading it, it's hilarious. So one of the quotes, he said, Wilson likes to pay respect to 101 officials, I, on the other hand, come into contact with him as little as possible. They consider the entire partnership to be empty mechanical work, Mr. H. Wilson. Um, he wanted to collect uh, grain, crops, and food, and fruit trees, things that he saw were valuable, agriculture, and important. Um, another quote, he said that uh, when he asked how the things were going with Wilson on his trip, he said, Caesar of old, which was Wilson, went to the Senate and said, Vini, Vini, Vici, and I went on to the Wu Tai Shan and saw and went away where it was as barren as the plains in Nebraska. This was an area that Charles Burke Sargent wanted him to collect in, but the plants had not come up yet. So Sargent asked him to wait for the plants to come up so he could collect them, and he said, I would not have done so unless I was of a barnacle nature, which God helped me out never the time. He, did, he was impatient, he just wanted to move on to the next place. Collecting and he was a he he had amazing collections and we owe a lot to Frank Meyer but uh, he ended up disappearing and getting killed on the way back to Shanghai at 39. Um, really nobody really knows what happened to him under mysterious circumstances. So quite a quite a character. Anyway, if anybody wants a great book to read, Frank Meyer, Plant Hunter in Asia, a Christmas present for my boss, is great. All right, here's Walter Zappi. He brought us hunting dogs with him and Jack and this trip through the Himalayas. Um, so they would start. So they would start in the capital of Sichuan, which is Chengdu, and here's the route they would take all the way through the Tibetan lands up in the high, high elevation. Uh, extensive trip. So here's Wilson meeting with his 101 officials in the consulate at Chengdu, <laughs> what he does best. And here are some photos around the capital of uh, Sichuan. Beautiful area. Here's his collecting party that would go out. Um, these are some of the same people who worked with him, you know, uh, on several trips to come. And on June 16th in 1908, they left by way of Dujian. Uh, they say that, but you're going to see some amazing suspension bridges and uh, huge elevations. So I'll go to these very quickly. So this is Wo Long, and here you can see one of the bridges going over. This is a bridge way down here. So these are huge, huge valleys going through these rapids. Gorgeous. And uh, here's Mount Bay Long, and you can see in the background we're getting in higher elevations. And this is where he uh, saw Primula Vici, a uh, really pretty Primula. These again are the color, colorized slides of the black and white slide that he took. Uh, here's Dan by getting a little bit higher in elevation. Uh, this peak, I believe, was about 21,000 feet, this peak. Here's another view of Dan, which is absolutely gorgeous. And this is well, all of his photos are well before the time of like Ansel Adams and, and landscape photography. Just keep that in mind. Some of the photos are absolutely gorgeous of landscapes. Beautiful photo from this rocky riverbed heading through the mountains. Uh, here's Canding, which when I looked at it at first, I thought, man, that's a precarious place to put a town right at the base of this just sheer mountain going. Look, these lights go up forever. And sure enough, a couple of years ago, there was this ridiculous landslide that, that took a lot of damage. So um, he, he went through this town as well, so I'll show that on the side. Um, here's an example of another one of the suspension bridges. They zigzagged across these huge rivers the whole time. And here's this photo he snapped of uh, uh, some guys bringing back tea leaves. And you see they have like these little poles they attach. These packs are about 300 pounds, he said. And they would just kind of lean back if they needed a rest and kind of, kind of sit on the pole. <laughs> And just to give you a and carrying 300 pounds is bad enough, but just to give you a kind of idea of the area they're carrying. Here's the suspension bridge cutting across here. Yeah, this is all made out of bamboo. And bringing that they brought their dogs, and Wilson brought their dogs as well, there's great stories in his journals of them making these little special papooses with dogs. <laughs> and they had, to, they had their little coolies kind of strap the dogs on their back and they go across and one of the dogs got loose and almost took the coolie over the side and everything and they got almost all the way to the other side and went ran between all of their legs and almost knocking them down and made it to the other side. <laughs> Quite true. So just to give you some idea of how, how difficult it was to carry these, these bundles of tea, here's the guys who took pictures of them and look at, the, look at their nice little group they had. Well, Slightly dangerous, you think? I'm not sure if this is it going up here, but it is. And here's pictures of birds. Walter Zappi was collecting long ways, collecting a lot of dead animals. Here's Reeves feathers that he was collecting. And here's, his, here's his dog. That, that's a cute dog. I wouldn't want that dog on a plant. 
So here's another fun bridge to cross. Uh, this is Ludin making their way back to Chengdu. And I consulted one of my Chinese friends, there's this gigantic wall that wraps around the whole length of this town. And I asked him if it was a great wall. He said it wasn't. I don't know, but it's a pretty amazing wall. From, this is just basically zoomed in. And these photographs are really high resolution, and anybody can access them on Harvard's website if you want. You can zoom in and get lots of little details and this little house out here. I mean, just gorgeous. Great, great resource. So making their way back into the capital, here they pass the big field of lotus in Chiang Rai and the great, great gate of Chiang Rai making their way back into Chiang Rai. So that was, that was their journey that they took. Um, some more plant introduction, the Pyrus Calariana, of which we get our Bradford hair. Thank you. Um, Magnolia Wilsonii, beautiful Magnolia. Uh, the Chinese dogwood, Cornuscusa chinensis. Uh, here's a full of our Milky Way. Circus uh, racemosa, the chain flowered redbud. I thought it was a very cool redbud where it has these long racemes hanging down. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, hydrangea sargentii, climbing hydrangea. Sorbaria arborea, just a fun little say. The false spirea. Um, beautiful plant. Sorbus sargentiana, sargent rowan. Nice flowers, compound leaves. Big clusters of berries. Here it is in the fall. Very nice fall color. Uh, creeping, uh, creeping little sweet box, a uh, Himalayan sweet box, Sarcococca humilis, which you see around. Gorgeous little plant, very fragrant. Venicera metida, box leaf honeysuckle. Uh, that's the yellow bagus and skull cultivar. Gorgeous little purple berries. Um, and then I can't even begin to start talking about all the rhododendrons that Betty brought back from his expedition. It would take too long. Um, luckily, I got to visit Kerr Hayes Castle and some of the uh, Burn Troops nurseries and some of these places where he sent some of his original rhododendrons and just left some original collections there. They're just fresh. So that's a cornwall. Okay, chapter five. I'm going to make it a promise. Lilies along the road of broken bones. So mm -hmm. There's some <laughs> This is going to be a sport trip to China. Uh, it's going to be uh, Hubei and Sichuan again by way of Trans-Siberian Railroad this time in 1910. On um, the previous trip, uh, they observed many conifers, but they weren't producing a lot of seed at the time. And they said that I'm sorely afraid fates intend to treat me severely this year in the matter of conifers. This was in 1908. Um, Lilium regal, which was to be his claim to fame, was uh, seen on this trip but not collected. So, um, and they. They were pretty let down by the collecting of Frank Meyer because he collected for them for a while and then eventually was like you know, three of these people and went off on his important collections for the USDA. So they had to go back and collect more conifers. Um, so some of the finest specimens of lily were found in the mountains of western Hubei during this trip. Uh, so just to orient you again, here's Hubei. And we're going to be going here. Um, most of the time, uh, Wilson traveled, he had a sedan chair with him. He, didn't, he said he didn't ride in it a lot. This is one that two people carried, one on the end and one on the back. But it was a status symbol. It's one of those customary things that, you know, somebody like Frank Meyer would think is just silly and just go out by himself. Um, well, he wanted to make sure that, that it was more of a, like, he, there was a chance he could get attacked and seen as like a wandering, um, a wandering uh, foreigner. So having the sedan chair was something to do with the status symbol. So a lot of times they just carried it along with them as he would walk. Sometimes he would ride in it. Yeah. And on this trip he did ride in it. <coughs> so this is northwestern Szechuan. So these are some of the lilies he started seeing in these sandstone cliffs. Um, here's a lily of browning eye. Here you can see some of the lilies hanging over the cliffs right here. About 2,500 feet, lily of Formosiana. Um, one of my favorite plants, Cardioprinum giganteum, was discovered uh, and collected on this trip. Um, just to give you an idea of collecting the lily bulbs, the last trip they had a lot of bulbs rotting. They found out packing them in clay makes it preserve them a lot, a lot better, so they were packing lily bulbs in clay and crating them. This is a picture of some of his workers and the kind of setup they had once they got back from working in the field. Uh, while collecting, Lilies. Unfortunately, uh, Wilson's team was caught in a landslide. And you remember those pictures, those precarious bridges through the mountains. And you can imagine if a landslide came here, you're pretty much caught there, um, caught in the lurch. Uh, so his sedan chair, much of his team was carried hundreds of feet down to the river below. Uh, he leaped out of his sedan chair, but suffered a severe compound fracture. Um, unfortunately, he was laying there in the mountains. We can imagine it must have been terrifying. 
Um, reading in his journal, he said that a uh, mule team came along right after the accident, and about 40 mules carefully stepped over you know, on the way down the mountain. Um, and uh, he said in a quote later on that their hooves to him looked as big as a plate laying there while they were stepping over him. <coughs> his camera has been carried down the mountain, unfortunately that's why there's not many photos left from this trip. But uh, he fashioned a makeshift slit out of a tripod um, and made his way down the mountain. Very bad break in his leg, and he had a limp the rest of his life that he called his little limp. <laughs> so some missionaries found him. They helped him the rest of the way down the mountain. He ended up here at the, uh, the Friends Mission of Dr. Davidson here in Ching. They took him back to Chengdu, uh, the capital of Sichuan, and uh, they basically looked after him. Um, it was, I think it was about 60 hours that he spent. I think about 60 hours that he spent with this broken leg making his way down the mountain. Basically, they almost had to amputate it. It was infected. He think he had to spend about four or five months, if I recall, off, you know, in bed rest before he could walk on crutches. Very, very bad break. Um, here's the actual, uh, his actual letter he sent to Sergeant. Um, yeah, over 60 hours elapsed since the accident. The leg was much swollen. Operation, therefore, was a long one, requiring more than an hour under chloroform. Dr. Davidson was kindly and at my placed at my disposal a room on the ground floor. Mrs. Davidson took over to be a nurse. Everything was possible uh, for my comfort, etc. So they looked after him, and he had trained his. He, he, he took 12 weeks to recover, um, but he had trained his uh, workers so well. He had such a good rapport with him that they continued collecting without him. And by the time he made his way back to Harvard, um, 400 packages were waiting for him when he returned that they had gone on collecting without him. So as a kind of a testament to the kind of rapport he had with his workers. So I think that's, uh, that says a lot. So some of the plant introductions, of course, his famous one, the regal lily. We're growing in uh, England. Here it is at Farquhar Nurseries in Massachusetts in 1920. Pretty nice, uh, pretty nice setup they have for lilies there. <laughs> um, can you imagine being the first year you plant all those bulbs and see them come up? <laughs> that would kind of knock yourself up a little bit. Uh, pretty good, pretty good introduction. Uh, Lillian Davidii, Lillian Davidii Volmatii, also mm -hmm. collected. Anemone hupeensis, many pitifolia. Uh, this was an interesting one. The Vegas long petiole lottery, with these longer little petiole, an interesting beech tree. Um, anyway, again, there weren't very many pictures for that because his camera ended up in the river. So, moving on to Japan. Introducing Princess Kuruma, chapter six. So Japan was almost the opposite situation as when he went to China. They had been under constitutional monarchy since the Meiji period, it opened up to the West. They fought alongside the Allied powers eventually in, uh, in World War I. Uh, they declared war on Germany in, in uh, 1914, kicked them out of many of their colonies in the Pacific, uh, removed the Germans also from the Shidong province. <coughs> In China, so they were working with us in World War One, and very friendly relations between the two countries. Um, and uh, this is when he, Wilson began taking his family on collective trips with him. So he made two trips to Japan, 1914 to 1918, and collected and captured some of the most amazing photography of the early 20th century in Japan. Um, and you'll see coming out then. Just keep in mind, at the time of his first trip, Ansel Adams was about 12 years old, and I think some of these photos rival anything of those early events in the So, most, uh, most notable introductions that he, uh, that he had were the Wilson 50 Bruma Azaleas, which um, kind of took his place for him. So here's his first picture of the, uh, of the Kuruma Azalea, which he, he liked to call very regally, Her Royal Highness Princess Kuruma. Um, and then asked later, he said, proud am I of being a fortunate one to introduce this exquisite damsel to the garden of Eastern North America. So, language, looking very sharp in this all-white suit arriving in Japan, I must say. Um, so, uh, Kruma Zellia's um, heritage is kind of unsure. There's tons of names through the, through the literature. I'm looking up just briefly before I name, but uh, uh, some of the names, uh, Rhododendron uh, Emperor, uh, and Caiusianum, Setens, Tucson, um, and all of their forms, all these they, they used to hybridize, and they were all in this little island with so that's roughly um, the background of that. So 
so I just want to get right into the photographs because they are amazing. So first, again, he arrived by train, uh, basically traveled by train the whole country. It was a, a lot nicer trip than China. <laughs> um, as you can see, he's enjoying himself walking down the street. Very westernized clothes or something. Um, here's his wife and daughter posing for a little shot, riding in one of the little carts. Um, here's a, yeah, a photo of him with his family. And of course, he had to travel in the political circles while he was there. Um, and Marita, a lot of writing about Marita, he was his uh, quote unquote boy while he was working there. He worked with them exclusively. And they had a really great friendship. So here he is visiting some beautiful nurseries. And uh, interesting, some of these some of these huge, huge shrubs they have, some of the bonsai and such. Here's a lot of the little Karuma azaleas kind of made up at the standard that he can set us up. Again, 1914, 1918. It's a gorgeous uh, street scene photo in uh, Hondo, I believe it was, uh, a water <coughs> Another beautiful photo from the shore of uh, this is kind of part of the, the Japanese white pine, a little island, a rocky island for the Japanese white pine the gorgeous. Uh, one of my favorite photos of this is from that same area looking out into the water. And, uh, I believe this is one of those uh, workers' wives that I've been showing them now. Here she is in front of the uh, tiger lily lily and lance holding. Nice, uh, nice grove of kind of extensive floors with the red pine, and for scale, I love that Wilson always puts a person in his photograph. So for scale, you can see after the very bottom, a little dude down there <laughs> having a good time. Again, little dude standing there. So it's kind of extensive floor, really nice, triple, multiple, quadruple trunk, uh, beautiful kind of extensive floor. Probably my favorite photo, the Prima Sobertella very variety of Kunja with the weeping heat and cherry with one of the, I think this was during the time of the lead up to World War II as one of the watchers <coughs> out over, over the fields. It's really, really gorgeous. Cool um, these are big pines of Bergia, Japanese black pine, and again, <laughs> probably Marita standing there by it, just for scale. Some of the coolest kind of dreamlike photos almost are these kind of Really gorgeous photos he took uh, through the Cryptomeria Forest. And a lot of photos of these Cryptomeria Forest on the, uh, the Harvard DIA. So I put them up um, in their free time. And this is some gorgeous photography. Um, one of my favorite trees, I finally got one, a little container. I don't have a yard, but I have containers. And I finally got myself a gorgeous little side of this particulata, uh, Japanese umbrella pine. And here again, for scale. Giant Inca Biloba, of course. Uh, Thuyopsis Delobrata. I didn't know Thuyopsis get that big. This was listed as Thuyopsis Delobrata. I don't know. I, there was no shot at the top of it, but if it is, that's a, that's a hunk of Thuyopsis. So, uh, and I, I, I taught a, a plant ID course last semester um, for the undergrads. And this was one of our, our favorite uh, Latin epithets Delobrata. It actually uh, means little battle axe or little axe. If you look at the undersides of the leaves, mm -hmm. if you take a little toothpick with you and you just pop that little section off and put it on a toothpick, it kind of looks like a little battle axe. <laughs> I just had to share that. I think that's cool. I, I, I read that out of a Q article. I don't know if it's true or not, but I think uh, Delobra means axe to the So the Unotaki waterfall, gorgeous waterfall, the, uh, the five, five leaf of rhododendron, the rhododendron foliage uh, along the riverside. Um, just to get an idea of the, the scale of collecting, these are large tomes. So this is uh, Nakamura and his family who were working with them as well, collecting very, very large amounts of large tomes. As you can see, that's a, a heck of a job. So a beautiful Atelia Miliana, again in the center of town, kind of busting out of its little <laughs> resting bar there. So really good. You see they have it propped up. Like we do with the, it's really cool here. Gorgeous. So wrapping up here, uh, Keeper of the Arboretum. So this is going to go be talking a little bit about the end of the career of the H. Wilson. So later in life, as I said, his father figure, um, Charles Drake Sargent, um, it was kind of understood at this point that 
Wilson was going to be working there, working up his material, going to make a career there, and eventually take over as keeper of the Arboretum. Um, so this was the kind of relationship that was developing at the time. But he did have some final years as a collector. So he went to the Ryukyu and Bonin Islands in 1917 Japan. Um, he also went to Korea and the adjacent islands in uh, 1917. He went to Formosa, which now Taiwan, to collect Taiwanian Kutumiroides. Um, and he also did a whirlwind trip through Australia, New Zealand, India, Tasmania, and South Africa in 1920. So he wasn't done collecting yet, but um, for time's sake, I'm not going to go through all these trips. But uh, here he is meeting with some officials who were right there. Um, and here is his daughter Muriel growing up again on the rooftop in Korea. Uh, um, I wish I had time to talk about Formosa. It's really interesting. Um, he basically, this was his band that he put together to go out collecting with him for the Taiwanian. These are reformed headhunters. <laughs> reformed. So they don't cut heads off anymore. It's a pretty good tradition of headhunting at the time. And uh, we actually have the grass here that he talks about. And he's from, he's from uh, I think he, he descended from headhunters. So about it a bit. But these are reformed ones. And the reason they needed reformed ones to block this up a little bit is because you would run across <laughs> non-reformed headhunters and you could you imagine being bold enough to ask the, I, I tried to kind of you gotta see what's there. Um, can you imagine walking around the corner and he actually asked this guy to stop him and take a picture with him. Now look at this, he's got this gigantic probably head cut axe right here. A belt full of what must be elephant bullets, I don't know. This huge gun. Barefoot, of course. So I mean, this is this was this was his protection of traveling through Taiwan at the time. <laughs> and this was apparently a common occurrence walking along the mountain roads. And <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that woke everybody up. <laughs> so you know, next time you go out to your garden and look around, just think, you know, people risk life and limb and always have their heads cut off with these beautiful plants. <laughs> kind of gives you a new perspective. So in the later years, as keeper of the Arboretum, E.H. Uh, Wilson uh, was awarded the George R. White Medal of Honor in 1915. Um, he received an honorary MA from Harvard in 1916, was appointed assistant director of the Arnold Arboretum in 1919, another Beach Medal, Beach Memorial Medal in 1926 for all of his amazing introductions and all of the books he had written up to this point. He was appointed, was finally appointed keeper of the Arboretum in 1915. So uh, here he is, standing in front of the Honeywell Administration Building as the new director again, looking good in his three-piece suit as always. Um, he was awarded the Loader Cup by the RHS and the Road Engine Society in 1928. Made a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1926. Awarded a gold, uh, centennial gold medal by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society in 1929. And then it became Dr. Ernest Henry Wilson in 1930. Um, by getting an honorary doctorate through Trinity College. Um, so here he is again in front of the Honeywell Administration building at Harvard. And unfortunately, as we hear the J.C. Rawson note all too well, some of the great luminaries and, you know, died way too, way too young, and that was the case with Wilson. He and his wife were driving on an icy road in Massachusetts and went off a cliff. Both of them died instantly, unfortunately, in 1930, I believe. So unfortunately, he died early. That was that was a tough year for. Uh, I think they lost also Char uh, Sergeant. I think that year the Arboretum also lost Sergeant and one of their great botanists, or another one of their great botanists. So a tough year for uh, the Arnold Arboretum. Uh, but the rest of his life, he spent lecturing to to you know enthralling audiences with the tales of his you know dangerous and difficult travels and adventures collecting these plants, very Indiana Jones of the hills, I'm sure. And uh, he, he always had visitors to his garden. Here he is meeting visitors to his garden. Um, and here he is again with his favorite plant, uh, Lily Ruth Walker Gall, growing in the first discoverer. And uh, he got the credit for working out that material too, so his name is the authority on this one. A lot of his introductions he's not the authority on because, of, because he collected a lot of material that had already been, uh, been worked up in but Lillian Regal was one that he uh, got out of the board. 
And later in his office talks in his books, he speaks of his plants almost like his children. Like he, he, he sees them and he'll remember them fondly. And he, he, he's, he literally refers to them as his children. So he has quite a special relationship with plants that's probably unique to him and only a handful of, of plant explorers. Um, and I'll just close with an image of him inspecting some of his azaleas near the end of his life. Um, and I'll close with a story that I read where he was giving a speech in front of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. And he had a speech prepared. He was going to talk about the state of horticulture or whatever he was going to talk about. He walked up with his speech and he saw at the podium that somebody had set a big urn of flowers, a big uh, beautiful display of flowers and branches and everything. And, you know, he kind of sat there. Everybody was like waiting to hear you know, the great age was talk. And he kind of put his, he put his talk down and didn't really pick it up again. Started pulling out flowers and branches out of the urn, and he proceeded to tell the life history and the story about every single one of those plants. You know, the audience apparently was just quiet and just, you know, enthralled with the story, and he told it, and, you know, this was one of the last speeches he ever gave, he just told the history and the story about collecting these, and, you know, went romanticized as he does, as you can see in his reading. It must have been an amazing talk, I would love to have been there for it, but apparently he gave the life history of every single one of these branches, every one of these flowers, and he would pass, set them down, take out another one, give the life history, you know, harrowing stories, I'm sure, until the entire urn was empty, and they just went and sat down, and apparently the crowd went by. So, um, quite an amazing man. So hopefully I've given you a little bit of appreciation. If you didn't know much about plant collecting and plant exploration, or Dr. Wilson, I hope uh, if you uh, kind of keep an eye out for the Sony eyes out there and keep an eye out for plants that uh, might have come from China and, and kind of think of the people who risk life on them going out there to uh, introduce these to our people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Anyone have any questions for him? Raise your hand. Um, if you do a Google search or any kind of search on Harvard BIA, just the Visual Information Access, you can look at Joseph Rock or E.H. Wilson, Frank Meyer, all these amazing collectors. They are basically just taking these large glass negatives from these old Sanderson cameras, scan them in, and you can blow them up to like, you know, 2,000 you know, 2, by 2,000 and really zoom in on. I mean, I can't believe the database they put together. And it's, I still go on there, you know, every week or so just to look random random pictures of, of collections and um, just it's it's an amazing resource. I can't believe I didn't know about it until just last year. But the majority of the black and white pictures that you saw either came out of uh, books that were written by each Wilson, but most of them came out of, of that website through Harvard. <coughs> No, he didn't write much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know how they made through that, made it through that early in the year. It seems like he was hardly home at all. So I, don't know. I imagine she was just being a proper English lady back home. She was probably gardening. I imagine. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Did you say something about that dove tree that it was double? Something. Double dormancy. What? Tell me what that the is. seed has to, has to go through two winters essentially. So like the radical of the seed has to break dormancy the first year, and then the second year the the probably the shoot will break dormancy. And they had never seen that before apparently. So. And all these pictures, a lot of these towns that they went into, these early explorers, they were the first person there. They didn't only collect plants and photograph and document plants. They photographed and documented the people that lived there, the animals, everything. So, I mean, think of horticulturalists. Some people think, oh, you just like to go garden. But these people literally were the first scientists into some of these remote areas where Westerners had never been before. So, and it was all due to this kind of like urge of adventure to find and bring new things back. Um, so, I think horticulture as a study and as a practice is, is up there in the highest esteem as any other scientific study. So, yes. There was no mention of National Geographic uh, of um, sponsoring any of this stuff. National Geographic? Yeah, was, it, was he, he even around then? I don't know. Does anybody know how far back National Geographic was? 
1900s? Around, around or somewhere around. I mean, maybe they they were a partner in some of them. I didn't I didn't read about that. Uh, what happened to the dove tree that was uh, <coughs> growing in the uh, in the lath house in the down. old lath house? <laughs> <laughs> Tim cut it down, blame him. It was it was bangled anyways. It, and I'm guessing when they redid the lath house in about 2005, it looked like it really got badly damaged to the backside of the actual house. It had never flowered until it was a year or so before. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you guys all want to pitch in and actually have one from the area that Wilson collect, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> so I have plenty of friends who speak Chinese in the department. We'll take a, we'll take a collecting trip. <laughs> Is Pam back? No, she's not. Yeah. I just want to give a special thanks to her. She was the one who started me. Like one one five minute conversation that I had with her one day when I was working out here at the Arboretum. Talking about Longwood and all these amazing opportunities is kind of what got me my start. So I was, I was hoping to thank her. Yeah. <laughs> Encourage young people in horticulture to listen. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, thank you very much, Jason. Great presentation. <laughs>